So let's pray for God's work as it continues on. In Acts chapter 13, we will be considering, in many respects, the beginning of missions as we, as we know it in the New Testament age. And God uses, I think, one of the most extraordinary vessels, the most extraordinary people that he could use. And that is a man that we know so well called the Apostle Paul. And yet I think that we forget that he was not always a Christian. He was not always a Christ follower. It's easy to forget that he was a murderer, that he was a persecutor of Christians, that he put them into prison. He did anything he could to destroy the Christian faith. One day the Lord meets him on the road to Damascus and he trusts in the Lord and he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? And he turns to the Lord and immediately the Bible tells us that he is preaching Christ. Such a drastic change. But he becomes almost too hot to handle there in the city of Damascus and so he has to, to flee, let down out of the city in a basket. And we know from, from uh, reading Acts chapter 9, we know about this, but he also gives us some more details in Galatians chapter 1. We know then that he goes into the desert of Arabia for a few years. And I think it's at this time that he really begins to learn who the Lord Jesus Christ is. We know also from comparing those scriptures, then he comes back to Damascus. And then for some reason, within his heart, he is burdened to go to Jerusalem where the first church was started. And he goes to Jerusalem and the believers don't want to have anything to do with him. Who is this guy? This was the one who has persecuted us. This was the one who had us arrested in the past. How can we trust this man? Remember, this has only been about four years since his conversion. And where, is he, where has he been? He's been in the desert. And praise the Lord, there was an encourager called Barnabas that spoke to the disciples and said, this man, I can vouch for him, basically. I know he's a changed man. But even then he was like too hot to handle because we read in Acts chapter 9, 29 and 30 and also later on in his testimony he speaks about this. Basically they packed him up in a ship and sent him off back home to his place that he'd come from, Tarsus, in Turkey. Sent him back there. Why? Because it seemed that whenever... Paul spoke, he would cause division. He would cause anger. And you get almost the picture here that the church at Jerusalem didn't want this man because he was stirring up trouble wherever he went. He was preaching the Lord Jesus, but it was causing them trouble. He caused them trouble before he was saved, and now he's causing them trouble again. And so he goes back to Tarsus. And he's probably there for a period of about three years. So if you put the maths together, maybe from his time of salvation, it's about six years or so before the Lord really can begin to use him. And there's an important lesson for you and I. Be faithful to the Lord. No matter what happens, be faithful. And if the Lord wants to use you, which he does each one of us, he will open the doors when we're ready. Let's come to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would burden us in a greater way with missions. Thank you, Lord, for the burden that you placed on many here today to give towards missions. We pray that you would place a greater burden on us to pray for missions. Thank you for the prayer that has gone out this week through, throughout the night and throughout the day.
We thank you for the ongoing prayers throughout the year, not only in this place, but in many other churches as well. Lord, we thank you for those that have said, yes, I want to serve you in other places. Lord, we can say yes here and we can serve you here as well. Thank you that you are preparing us, but Lord, we pray that when you give us the burden to follow you in a deeper way, that we would do that. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Two weeks ago we looked at the first church that they were called Christians and that was Antioch of Syria or it's in in Turkey actually today. You can see that by that position number one. And I shared the story of how it was a difficult place for us when we visited it because there was there was some things that we uh, found very difficult but I love hearing about this Antioch in Syria because this is where they were first called Christians and this was really the first missions church. But just to confuse you, there's another Antioch. You can see it by number six there, Antioch of Pisidia. You might say, well, why are there so many Antiochs? Well, named after a king in the past called Antiochus. And so to commemorate this king, that's why you have a number of Antiochs. And so the message today is from Antioch to Antioch. And what we're really looking at is Paul's, just part of Paul's first missionary journey. To Antiochs, places that the Lord is going to use in Paul's life, places that the Lord would use for the gospel to go out throughout the whole world. I ask you to draw your attention to Acts in chapter 13 and we're going to go through this chapter rather quickly but my desire is that we would get a burden for missions because this, as I say, this is the beginning of Christian missions. We praise the Lord for people like the Apostle Paul and Barnabas and others that desired to go into the whole world to preach the gospel so that today we have the gospel that we can receive. So we read about this church at Antioch, which is in Syria, the first one, where they were first called Christians. Verse 1, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, which means that he would have been a dark man. And it says there, dropping down to verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So Saul, as he is then called, comes to Antioch there in Syria. And he is a part of that ministry, a part of that growing church. I tried to to see how large that uh, city of Antioch in in Syria was and and some have thought it could have been 400,000 or more. This is a large place. And so when you start to see how the scripture tells us that there is growth, I think the growth is far greater than we probably comprehend. I think we're probably seeing thousands come to know the Lord. That wouldn't be any exaggeration. We're not told that exactly, but we know that there is a real movement of God. And you can imagine as that church is growing, they would need all the leadership that they could so that there is unity and so that the growth continues. But God lays on their hearts to set aside two to go out as missionaries. Probably two of the most key people. It's interesting, and you'll follow through this as we go through the chapter. It says there in verse 2, it mentions Barnabas first and Saul. What you find in the beginning is that Barnabas is number one. He's the encourager. Without a Barnabas, you would not have had the Apostle Paul who became the great missionary that he was. We may not be able to go onto the mission field overseas, but we can encourage. Barnabas was this encourager. Without him, would the Apostle Paul have remained in Tarsus, back in his home? 
And so they leave from the city of Antioch of Syria, that place where they were called Christians first. And they go out in the mission field and they come to an island called Cyprus. That was where Barnabas had come from, so he would have been familiar with the people there. There were probably relatives. And the Bible tells us there that they go throughout the island preaching and teaching the word as missionaries. They come to a place called Paphos. You read about it there in verse 6. Paphos is right down the, the, the western end of the island. We visited that place there. You see the ruins of it. Not far by is this, this beach. It's considered to be a beautiful beach, but it's just rocks on the beach. It is picturesque. Those who lived at the time, the, the Greeks and the Romans believed that this was where Aphrodite had come, come to earth, the goddess of love. So it became a very important place. But I know as we walked through the ruins of Paphos, I was thinking about what we see proclaimed here in the Word of God. What I believe you're going to see is that the Apostle Paul sees a great change happen in his heart, a great change that happens in his life so that he becomes the missionary that he does. And so perhaps we should pick up the, the story there in verse 6, the account here. It says, Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was by Jesus, which means son of Jesus. Who was, who was with the proconsul, notice Sergius Paulus. Interesting, his name literally means little wonder. Interesting name. And sometimes people were, were named according to their stature or according to who they were. It's interesting, the Romans would just name their, their, their daughters by number. And so if you said your name as, as a daughter in, in Latin, it was immediately known that you were the sixth or the seventh daughter or whatever. So, so names were, were important on one hand, but sometimes people were all, almost dismissed in their, in their naming. And so it says there in verse 7 that he, this Sergius Paulus, was an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and he sought to hear the word of God. He wants to hear the word of God. This man who is a leader in the community, who is a ruler in the community, he wants to hear the word of God. But notice what it says there in verse 8, but Elimas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn the proconsul away, that is Sergius Paulus, away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all, and of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And you continue on and you see there in verse 12, then the proconsul Sergius Paulus believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of of the Lord. There is a great change that happens in Paul's life here. How do we know? From now on, he is no longer called Saul, but he is called Paul. And I think he renames himself because of what happens here. We don't read elsewhere in Scripture that he leads somebody else to the Lord personally until this point. He could have done. But there's something that really touches his heart here. I think he, he sees the evil of, of the demonic world. And if ever you have seen that, you don't want to see it. And it changes your perspective and you realize that we need to serve the all-powerful God, the one and only God. I think he would see the evil that is here as a result of this. He sees the way that God works through this and he sees this man Sergius Paulus 
come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal saviour. And I say to you, I think this has such a dramatic effect on, on Paul that after this you see it is Paul that is leading the missionary journey. Maybe up until now there could have been doubts in his life because he'd been put aside, but now the Lord has changed his heart and he wants to lead, he wants to serve. And sometimes we can miss this. Notice that uh, the man that he led to the Lord, Sergius Paulus, his, na- his last name, or part of his name there is Paulus, which is simply Paul. I think, number one, the Apostle Paul names himself after this first convert, this first convert in this place. Because of what he had seen happen here, he was changed as a result of the work of God. First of all, do we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal saviour? Secondly, has God touched us in such a way over things we see around us? Has he touched us in such a way that we can see that we need his work in our life? It will change you. I remember as a 19-year-old, the first person that I led to the Lord Jesus Christ, and it changed me. All of a sudden I thought, yes, we are ambassadors. We've got the opportunity, every single one of us. I used a gospel tract. I didn't know what to say. I used a gospel tract and then I was astounded that the person actually trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal saviour. And then I was even more surprised to see that they walked with the Lord and that they grew. These things will change us. But I think the other side of it is when Paul renames himself as Paul, he's putting the old behind because Saul is associated with the king of Israel who was not one who sought the Lord. And Paul renames himself now and it means little or small. It's not necessarily so that Paul was a short man in stature, but I think he sees himself as small before God. And he sees that God is everything. And that will change you. That will change you. And so there is such a change in his life that from here on, it is Paul that is leading the missionary journey, no longer Barnabas. And to to get an idea of what it must have been like here as they left the the island of Cyprus, as they left Paphos and, and went across to what we call Turkey today, They come to the part of Turkey that is absolutely mountainous. I remember being in a bus and going through those mountains at night thinking at any time that we would go off the road. The road was so narrow and windy. And here is Paul and Barnabas. They're having to make this journey to Antioch of Pisidia through the mountains, probably a journey of four or five days, many, many kilometres We don't get a picture really of how difficult it was for them. And then they come to this place, Antioch of Pisidia. I tried to find out what the population of this town was because in some ways it's important and some have felt maybe 50,000, this other Antioch. There is a stadium that they know there that could seat about 15,000 people. So I want you to get this image that this is a large place that they come to. But I've got before you the the method of the missionary. I want you to see how it is that the Apostle Paul approaches the situation as they come to Antioch of Pisidia. Look it up, look at uh, there in verse 14. Let's pick it up there. It says, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia. You just read that quickly and you think, oh, you know, that's that's from one place to the other. But think about the difficulty of the journey. And it says, they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they sat down. So why did they go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day? Because the synagogue is the place of worship for the Jews who meet on the Saturday. And what is Paul's method? What is Paul and Barnabas' method here? They're going to the people that they can connect with. They are both Jews. Jews. 
They know that if they come into a town and they go into a synagogue, they'll meet with fellow Jews, probably some that might be familiar to them in some respects, might be connected by relationship. So they go into the synagogue. They also know that when they go into the synagogue, there's a possibility that they might be able to speak. And I'm sure on that particular Saturday, the group of Jews that were meeting in that synagogue didn't know what they were doing when they said, Paul, you can speak. But that was a custom. In synagogues, if you had something to say, as long as you were a Jew, you could prove that you were a Jew, you could say some things. So, they go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they sit down and after reading of the law, And the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue, sent to them saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. If you've got any word of exhortation, any word of encouragement, now's your time to speak. And I can imagine Paul with the method here of reaching out to his own people and reaching out to those that he can connect with. He stands up, it says there in verse 16, and motioning with his hand. So we're going from being seated. This is inside, remember. He begins to speak. What's the lesson for you and I? Who are the people that we can connect with? Friends, relatives. That we can share the good news. We can share what God has done. The Apostle Paul and Barnabas are making the use of every opportunity and looking where they can connect so that they can reach out with the gospel. That's the method. I'd love to preach this whole message, but then you see the message. And I wonder, as I say, as Paul begins to speak and speak and speak, whether they thought, stop. Well, you know that. In many respects, they did. And Paul is able to connect with that which is familiar. Basically, he begins to speak to them and he tells them about the Old Testament, their their law. And he refers to how that God was faithful to Israel. You can read through that. You can see all the various things that he brings out that shows the faithfulness of God to his people. And so they would have listened to that and they would have been drawn in thinking, well, we're familiar with this. And then all of a sudden you see that Paul changes direction. He refers to David at the end of verse 22. And then he says this in verse 23, from this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a saviour, Jesus. So can you see the opportunity saying God is faithful? And that's an opportunity for us as well. We can remind people of the faithfulness of God, but then we need to remind them also that God showed his faithfulness in sending his son, the Lord Jesus. This is unfamiliar to them. It wasn't like there was a Christian church in town. This is is a new message. They need to hear that the Lord God has sent a saviour, Jesus. And as the message continues on, verse 28, it says, And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. So he tells of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the first part of the gospel, that the Lord Jesus Christ died. So the message is becoming very clear. He doesn't spend too much time speaking about the things that they knew. He's coming as quickly as he can to the gospel. And you and I, as we seek to connect with those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, connect with them, but look for opportunities to share the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, all we're doing is just connecting. 
And so he looks through this. He, he tells them then about the Lord Jesus Christ and how he, he had died. He tells them in verse 29 and 30, now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, they took him down from the tree, from the cross, and they laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. You can imagine the Jews hearing this message, God raised him from the dead, is this true? And you can see the Apostle Paul looking at their quizzical looks and, and, and responding in this way and he, and he confirms it and he says, but he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are his witnesses to the people. He's saying there's many witnesses that saw the Lord Jesus Christ alive again. He truly did rise from the dead. Not only did he die, on the cross but he came alive again and he rose from the dead and there are many witnesses to to record that and he says in verse 32 and we declare to you glad tidings that's good news that is the gospel that promise which was made to the fathers you can see the message there before you in in your notes you can see that God promised the Saviour, that the promised Saviour was put to death. The promised Saviour has risen from the dead. You can see that this is his message. And then he finishes off with something that is so, so important. Look at verse 38. Therefore, he's saying all these things, therefore let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, through the Lord Jesus Christ, is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. What is he saying? This one who died on the cross, this one who came alive again, the reason that he did that for you and I is because he is Saviour, and through him your sins can be forgiven. Through him you can be justified just if you had never sinned. This is the message of the gospel. And we live in a world around us. People are in pain. People are struggling. And what are they struggling with? Their sin. And they need to hear this message of forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the missionary message. I've seen it. By God's grace in many places, I've seen people that were in darkness, in fear. And then they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, recognize the forgiveness of their sins and the joy and the change that comes. This is a powerful message that we have. This is a life-changing message. And this is the message that he gives. And I want us to go beyond the message because I want us to see the result of this message, there were Gentiles. The Gentiles, unless they became proselytes, which meant that they had to adopt Judaism, weren't usually allowed in the meetings. They could, maybe on the outer circle, but they weren't encouraged too much. But obviously the Gentiles knew that something was going on, those who were non-Jews. Because it says there in verse 42, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So there were some Gentiles listening in. Who are these two strangers in town? I'm sure Paul must have got excited as he preached because somehow they heard his words and the Gentiles wanted to hear more about it. And they said, can we hear about it in a week's time? Now please picture this. Verse 44, on the next Sabbath, it says almost the whole city, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. What are we saying? We're saying thousands. We're not told the exact number, but we know it more than likely would have been in the thousands. Because it says almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. It's a city revival if you can look upon it that way. And that seems strange to us until you look back and, and, and not so long ago in, in the last century, and that's not so long ago, I remember that. 
Billy Graham came to Australia and there were something like 120,000 people that met in the MCG. The thousands that came to Christ and some would say, well, that was just superficial. I've met people that were saved through those meetings and they continued to walk with the Lord. You see here, what we have in the Word of God shows the impact of the Gospel. The whole city came together to hear the Word of God. And notice this verse 45, you get an idea of the amount of people because it says there in verse 45, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. They were saying, well, well, how come these people are listening to these strangers? It wasn't about the message from Paul and Barnabas. It was about the true message of the gospel that they wanted to hear. But the Jews were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Verse 46, then Paul, notice he's mentioned first, and Barnabas grew bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. And I want you to see What happens here? Verse 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as has been appointed to eternal life believed. There were obviously many that believed, that trusted in the Lord Jesus that day. As soon as the message is preached and as soon as people respond to the message, you find that there's going to be persecution. Whenever we see the Lord work, whenever we see people come to Christ, there will be persecution. It seems like a strange message in our day and age, in our Western church even. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 16, Straight after the Apostle Paul had come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, it was revealed to him what that he would suffer. They have to go on to another town. They are threatened with stoning. They have to go to another town and then Paul is stoned and left for dead and then later on he is whipped and beaten with rods. What the Lord said regarding him happened. He suffered. I spent time with missionaries overseas and I've seen the suffering that they experience many times, the, the difficult, almost impossible situations. But they do it because they want the message to go out. And if we suffer for the cause of the gospel, always remember that the Lord is with us. He never leaves us or forsakes. And so we read this here in closing. But the Jews, this is verse 50, stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. Was the message forgotten? No. There would have been a church that would have been raised up there, but the message continued. The message goes from Antioch of Syria to Antioch of Pisidia, but it continues. And it continues down through today. And the message is still true that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he rose from the dead, and through trusting in him, we receive forgiveness of sins. Oh Lord God, you can touch our hearts today reminding us of the power of the message that we have in our hands. How life changing it can be. Lord, I've received, received a glimpse as I'm sure many others have here 
of your wonderful work that happens when a person repents from their sin and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal saviour. The seed is planted and a life is changed. And so the mission's message goes on and forward. Lord, we meet here to comfort and encourage each other, but we meet here so that the message goes out and continues. And so, Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we have as a church to support missionaries. But, Lord, thank you that we have the opportunity also to be local missionaries in our community where we are. We give you all the glory. And Lord, today there is somebody who is not saved. I just want us to be reminded that the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. But you showed, you commended your love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you've told us that when we repent of our sin, Turn from our sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so Lord we know that anybody here that you may have touched that doesn't know you today they can simply call upon your name. They can say words like this Lord Jesus I know that I'm a sinner. Thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. I now ask you into my heart and my life. That may seem so simple to you, but the Bible gives us a promise there. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you for that message, that life-changing message for forgiveness of sin. In Jesus' name, amen.